Hello, hello, hello. What's going on, everyone? This is Brian Sanders. This is Peak Human. I just finished an amazing podcast with Mary Ruddick. Oh, man, she is the best. What a legend. Oh, man, we covered so many things. We debunked the blue zones. We talked about ancestral diets. We talked about the healthiest people in the world. We talked about, of course, what causes all the modern chronic disease and all the problems. Oh, such a fun episode. This one's also good for people who are new to all this. We really covered all the main myths, all the stuff that people have heard in the mainstream that is wrong, had a really balanced discussion. We even talked about plant foods, plant toxins, and how they can be bad for you in excess, and so much more. So check this one out. Mary is a nutritionist. She runs an amazing practice called Enable Your Healing. She travels around the world studying the world's healthiest people. She's going to all the blue zones. She's been almost everywhere you can think of. Check out her previous episodes with me. She's an absolute legend. I'm telling you, everyone loves her. She's so knowledgeable about this stuff. You're really going to enjoy this podcast. You'll definitely learn about animal-based diets. And uh, we actually even talked about pork a lot this episode. And nose of tail pork actually came up. We do have a lot of pork left, and it's on special. And we feed it the corn-free, soy-free diet, and my ranchers use milk, like she talked about, the healthiest way to raise pigs with leftover milk. My ranchers did that. You can still get this pork, pasture-raised. It's great. Go to nosetail.org. Support our ranchers there. Get the body care there. And thanks, everyone. Enjoy this episode with Mary. Holy smokes, everyone. <laughs> We're back with Mary Ruddick, the famous Mary, traveling the world. She's back. How's it going? So good. It's so good. And it's great to be back in the States. <laughs> yes, you're finally back in the US. You got some decent Wi Fi. Oh, wow. You were. It's so funny because there was a Weston A. Price conference and I got all these messages from people because you're a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I, I meet Mary. I met Mary. Oh, it was so nice. I, I assumed everyone had kind of forgotten who I was because I've been out of the States so long. So it was really lovely uh, to see so many people in, in person and, and to get to connect with so many people. It was just incredible. That's great. We'll talk about your presentation too, because that uh, kind of can guide us in this discussion, all the new stuff you've learned over the past few years. Recap for people. I had Mary on many years ago with a two-part episode that people love, people went crazy for. And then we did a four-part series recapping our trip to Africa together. So Mary was with me and my uh, filmer Jay for Food Lies. And we uh, went all throughout Africa, visited all these tribes. It was amazing. Mary set it all up. Give us the, the two-minute recap on that one. Oh, from our African trip. Yes. So that was, we went through Tanzania and saw several tribes there from the Iraq to the Datoga to the Chaga, the Maasai, of course, and the Hudza. And then we hightailed it over to Uganda, which was no small feat in the middle of COVID and got there by the skin of our pants <laughs> just in time to drive across Uganda on a pretty wild road trip and then get to the Batwa who live in the indigenous, the, the forest there, the impenetrable forest are just right outside of it these days. We got to see the gorillas. It was pretty, it was a fabulous trip. And then on the way back, we made our plane again, just like by the skin of our teeth and, <laughs> and became instant friends. It was a wonderful trip, really wonderful trip. Uh, I headed down to South Africa after that. I think you guys went back to America, correct? We did. We made it home safely. I had my huge, uh, what was it, like a machete from the Batwa that I brought yeah. back on the plane. And so those are the pygmies that people have heard of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we had quite a trip. So go back and listen to those episodes. <laughs> you can hear the full breakdown that uh, that's all going to go in the Food Lies series, which we're working on daily to finish episode one. So Jay who we went with was, was here in Austin. We filmed some more. We're going to film a couple more interviews in the Bay Area. Oh, it's going to be so good. So good. Watch <laughs> the trailer. Watch the intro on YouTube. Go to Food Lies YouTube. Watch the intro. I'm telling you, if you haven't seen it yet, you're going to be very impressed. Mary's in the film, of course. And we're going to catch up with her today. 
about all the new things she's learned traveling the world. How many places have you been? Or list some of the places you've been in the last couple of years since we talked. Well, we talked before that, but since we did a podcast. Uh, Well, I spent four months with the Mayans and the Toltecs in the forests of Mexico. That was a fabulous, fabulous trip. One of the best I've ever had. Uh, Spent a month in Mongolia with the Kazakhs, the eagle hunters and huntresses. Went up into Greenland for a month into the Arctic with the Greenlandic Inuit. They call themselves the Greenlandic folks. And uh, just in the last three months, spent a month in Papua New Guinea, going to six different regions and seeing many, many different indigenous communities, uh, almost countless. It was about 15. It was a lot. Wow. And then went to the hill tribes in Thailand and up into Myanmar. And don't tell anyone, though. Mm-hmm. And then uh, let's see, where else? Oh, the Omo Valley in Ethiopia, where I had to leave a little early and escape because the civil war and tribal warfare started again. They went into a state of emergency. It was definitely my most dangerous trip. Wow. Uh, the Amazon, I went into the Amazon and to some very interesting places there. And yeah, honestly, all over the world, I, I've been all over. It's been also all Okinawa. Oh, Okinawa. Recently. Yeah, I was just in Okinawa for a month. I almost didn't even remember to mention it. It's it's been a bit like a ping pong ball. I've been kind of rushing to get everywhere because since COVID, I've seen a rapid modernization. And so rather than sit and cut up footage from all of these indigenous uh, visits, I've been rushing around trying to get to as many places to film so that future generations can see what I'm seeing and our current generation can see what I'm seeing as well before it rapidly vanishes. That's a big theme in today's episode, the modernization and the these people are losing their indigenous ways. And why COVID? Is it because of lockdowns? Like what happened? Why, why since COVID? Yes. So it was already instilled in most of these regions, if not all, from the local governments that these places had to have a school of some kind. And when COVID hit, a lot of nonprofits and NGOs came in and said, you can't go to school. So we will bring you cell phones. They brought them cell phones and satellite towers and t-shirts and tennis shoes. And it has radically changed things all over the world, even places that take 10 to 14 harrowing days to get to, um, you know, where you're hiking or going by horseback or going by boat. There's no, there's no radio frequency. This is how remote a lot of these places are. And so the nonprofits coming in and giving these kind of tools has, has set about uh, a very rapid change, I would say. Hey everyone, cutting in for a second to talk about nosetail.org. Get our body care products made from beef tallow. These are the best. These are the best you'll ever have. Fragrances or additives, it's beef tallow, essential oils. This stuff is great. Get a meat box. We got the pasture raised pork. We got some specials. Go to nosetail.org, get it delivered right to your door, all 48 states. Thanks for supporting us and our ranchers. And not a good one, no. it sounds like. Well, not in my opinion. I mean, we'd have to ask them. You know, in my experience, there are many communities that want to modernize, and those are ones typically that have already been partially modernized or they're in touch with the outside world and the outside world from their country looks down on them. So they're not respected and therefore they want to modernize and be respected. Uh, The communities that typically are respected from the outside world take the Maasai that we visited, right? Uh, Traditionally, they've been treated very well and with a lot of uh, dignity from their country, but now they're getting shifted off their land. So things are changing, but typically those are the groups that hold on to their traditions much more. Yeah, this kind of makes sense to me because I saw it firsthand is if they're thriving in their ancestral ways and they're out there hunting or you know using the blood and the milk of the cows and doing their herding and nomadic lifestyle, then it's working for them and they're healthy and strong and good. But then, yeah, I guess, I guess we saw so that transition to the Maasai people that started living in the cities. And then, so once they cross over that threshold, then of course they want to keep up with the Joneses, as they say, right? And like yes. be more modernized and get more things. Yes, and but- also a lot to outside respect. Like when I was in Greenland or take the Canadian Inuit, they've been really ex- significantly persecuted. And because of that, uh, because of that, dynamic of people looking down upon them, they lose, their pride gets chipped away 
over time. And so they don't look at what they know as valuable. And instead they look at, it's almost like a, a sense of lack that they need to hurry up and figure out what everyone else knows and abandon their culture. And I think it's very understandable because it's a pattern I see worldwide. So I think it's a very human experience to have that, but, um, but it is very tragic and a bit sad uh, and definitely happening. Well, so tell people health wise what happens yeah. because sometimes if you don't know all this stuff, it's like, oh, that's great. They can get cell phones now and they're going to make more money maybe. But what happens to their health? Yes. So the health quickly deteriorates. So I really find there's a, and I, you know, this is a working theory. So I may see evidence against this. I haven't yet, but I may in the future. I usually see about three different types of villages. So the first type is the truly traditional. So if we take them aside, they're just drinking blood, milk, and eating meat, nothing else, right? They're living in their traditional way as well. They have their huts, they have the dirt, they live in the family dynamic, that's traditional. Then there's a a small hybrid, like maybe two foods have come in from the new world if we're talking about the Maasai, but if it's another culture, it may be something else. It could be whole foods too. So let's take uh, like corn and squash, okay? So it could be two things or beans. And then the third is very modernized, but still a bit traditional. Maybe they live in the traditional way, have the traditional family structures, but now maybe they have cell phones with uh, with data and Wi-Fi, not just uh, texting. Uh, The second group would have texting and (laughs) local texting and, and lots of modern foods and also modern clothing as well. So they might still live in their traditional houses though. So a bit of a hybrid. And I think that's what people are the most accustomed to seeing is that one. But the people that I go and visit really are far more traditional than that. And so they have impeccable health. There's nothing we could help them with or even offer to these people. They have what we dream of. In fact, when I was presenting at the Weston A. Price Conference this last weekend, I started out my presentation with a a mental exercise of having everyone close their eyes and imagine what utopia would be like. And we kind of brainstormed together. And most people would say, you know, oh, family, everyone's healthy, lots of energy, um, plenty of food to eat uh, in nature, all these things and everything they came up with. And also the things that they came up with that we wouldn't have in a utopia, like headaches and chronic illness, immediate illness, uh, dying from a young age or uh, dementia, all of these things as well, including mental disorders like (laughs) depression and anxiety and insomnia, um, none of those would be in utopia. And so then I tied that into the rest of my presentation, which was that is what these people have. They have all of the things that we were looking for. And because of that, they really deserve our incredible respect. They have a wisdom that we are searching for and have not been able to find on our own. And we are slowly and almost childlike trying to biohack our way into, (laughs) right? Uh, To get to even a semblance, even like a small portion of what they have on a daily basis. So that's the first village. The second village is going to have, in my experience again, very minor health issues that might be an infection every few years, like a flu. Um, The older generations, like 60 plus, might get pneumonia. And they typically die in old age still, but might be a little bit younger, like 70 to 80 instead of more like 80 to 100 in the first village. And they would have small health issues like nail fungus, you know, so nothing too significant. The third village will, the one that's really far more modernized, they will start to look more like us with our health issues and they don't have our modern medicine. So it's a, it's a bit tricky. And typically they haven't fully branched over to the financial system yet either because these groups don't use money with the exception of Papua New Guinea. So I'll show you something. All around Papua New Guinea, I I wish I should have had a show and tell. I have other Mm -hmm. things back in the room. But uh, this is a dowry, and this is money. And the women from all over Papua New Guinea, they wear something that is their financial system. So in the Northern Islands, where I I spent a bit of those beads for people listening? Oh, they're shells, actually. They're shells. Yeah. And each region has a different kind of shell, and they actually have a shell bank in each market. 
And so you can go and trade and buy and all of that, but the women will just take a shell off to pay for something. So they have a bit of a financial system, but typically there's not one. Wow. So I saw some of this. I was at the beginning of Mary's journey and she's done so much more since then. But I remember we had the tribe of elders that we set up and we thought we were going to find all these healthy people in, in old age. And we actually found out we were in an agriculture village and not one of the first villages categories that you mentioned. And so these people were eating a lot of ugali and they were just kind of reliant on the corn paste. You know, they get the paste of the goop. And they, they don't have a lot of animal foods to give them the proper nutrition. And they were kind of breaking down and they were hunched over and they had all these problems. So is that is that kind of what you saw elsewhere as well? Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's what I start to see. So that would be in the third type of village. So there was clear arthritis there. You could see it, right? Um, yeah, you start to see those things. But even for them, they, you know, they were an early enough generation on the modern living that they didn't have a lot of things until they were elderly. So most of their life, they were very healthy despite all the changes because they were raised until childhood, maybe like depending on which ones we asked, some were younger than others, but they were raised on a lot of traditional foods and then it shifted. So they had the animal nutrition and then they lost it, not knowing it was so important. And I thought that was such an insightful meeting that we had because they talked about the younger generations and how the younger generations are dealing with all these health issues that they didn't have at their ages. Um, and it, it was also really good to see the kind of uh, generational influx of chronic disease and when it comes in and uh, the patterns. Yeah. yeah. So just to kind of reiterate that, it's the, the oldest people that we saw. We saw a woman that was 105 in, in Uganda, jumping around, dancing, stomping, and she was still, you know, moving around like she was doing her thing. And so she didn't get any diseases into the old age. So the older they were, the, the older the diseases came in. And they were saying now the youngest generations, they get diseases very early. Right. So that's the main difference is how fast these chronic diseases come into societies and the early ages that they happen at. Well, and more than that, in the truly traditional regions, they don't get chronic illness at all. They die of old age and they don't get sick before it. So they go to sleep at old age and then they don't wake up. So in all of my, all of my questioning, all of my reporting, uh, they're very healthy into old age. And then the second, the second tier type of village, they'll get some illness in elderly years. And then the third would be more like the arthritis and the chronic stuff that starts at like 60 plus, you know, kind of like what, I don't know if your parents' generation was like this. My parents and my grandparents' generation was like that. You don't really get anything until you're at least 60, you know? And my grandparents was like more like 70 and now we're getting it much younger. So I know my family is a bit more spread out in terms of generations. So it may be mm -hmm. different for each of you, but well, well, that's the main thing. And no one's really putting this together because the mainstream is not talking about it or they're just prescribing medications or just normalizing it. It's actually what I posted online today is that they're doing the new obesity injections for six-year-olds, right? They're I'm testing. Sorry, what? Yeah, the Azempic. They're, they're like shooting up six-year-olds with Azempic and stuff. Wow. It's insane. And so this is now yeah. the new normal that society has created and the narrative is saying that this is fine and this is what happens and that we just need more obesity drugs to be injected into six-year-olds. Wow. That's a bit scary. Those haven't been tested generationally or in, you know, pre pre-fertility age people, <laughs> you know? It is yeah. wild. I, I, I wish people understood this on the mainstream level. Like they just don't. I even on Instagram, I post about it and my degree zero people, right? The people who are really get really on the same yeah. page and they get it, they know what's going on. And then you go one step away from that. If I, one of my Instagram posts goes a little viral yes. and, they, and then there's sort of random people seeing yeah. this, I can see the comments and they don't get it. They're, yes. they're, they're making comments like, what's the problem? They This helps the, if the kids have diabetes, it's gonna help them. And I'm like, are you crazy? Your kids' diabetes, this used to be only for adults, yes. right? A diabetes used to be an adult disease and then they would call it, how, what was the progression of that? 
So I usually see the progression of that in the type three villages, and they'll get that about age 55 plus, often 65 plus, they might get type two diabetes. We're talking about a very small percentage, though, of the population, mm -hmm. right? Like we're talking like two to 3% of the population. So it's not a large percentage like it is here in America now. But even if you look at the graphs here in America, it's just shot through the roof. Um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we never saw childhood diabetes with the exception of the 0.00% fraction that had type one diabetes, right? And it's so- totally different type one, yeah. Yeah, type one is totally different. And so we're seeing just a shoot through and honestly, living overseas and with how rarely I get home, it, it's shocking when I land. It's shocking when I land. One, I know as soon as I get on a plane where someone's weight is spilling over into my seat, I'm headed towards America, if not already there. Mm -hmm. um, there are benefits too, like people are very friendly. So not just the negative, but in terms of health, it's very apparent. There's a lineup of people for wheelchairs. When I landed in Cincinnati, my, my family's from Ohio. When I landed in Cincinnati, there was, you know how there's a rack for luggage that you get by mm -hmm. the baggage? Well, there was also a rack first for wheelchairs. Ooh. You don't see Ouch. that anywhere else in the world. For it's really elderly people or for very heavy people? All sorts of things. There was mm. at least eight people coming off my flight that were going to a wheelchair. And whether I'm in Europe or Asia, you just don't see the need for that, right? Oh. Every once in a while, you might see an exception where there's a person, but it's not the common. And so, yeah, the health here is is other. It's It's like another thing. And I think... Uh, it's been such a benefit to be outside of the world a little bit, both for the 12 years I was sick and then also for all this time I've been overseas because it's kind of jarring when you come back. I'm not in the fishbowl. You know, it's not water to me. It's something very observable. And I was telling, I was telling the crowd at the conference, I was sitting down at a restaurant with my parents and on the table of this fine dining establishment, there was an advertisement for treatments at the hospital <laughs> down the road. And I was like, what? what? How has this become so normal that uh, that illness is just, uh, everyone has it. And it's something to create a better, a better drug for. Yes. Okay. This is hurting <laughs> my head. So throughout history, <laughs> we were healthy and then we dropped dead. We died yeah. of accidents or maybe some severe infections to do with tainted water, right? So it's we're healthy and then we die. Then as you it's this slow progression. It's a it seems like a very linear slope yeah. down of as you get more into modern society, modern diet and lifestyle, you get disease earlier and earlier until now we're at the peak where you get it at six years old. Yes, that's what I'm seeing, definitely. And also all the mental disorders. It seems like everyone in the States is on a, a drug for anxiety, depression, something, something, something. You know, there's hundreds of diagnoses now in the mental branch. And that's indicative of, of being utterly unhealthy, right? You're not making your feel-good chemicals. Uh, and there's, there's probably a lot of reasons for that, uh, dietary and lifestyle-wise, and birthing and family structure and community and all sorts of things that play into that. But you can't deny that it's not here. Here. And when you go places where that doesn't exist, it, it can be pretty jarring. Yes, it is. I remember mm -hmm. you asking questions to the Maasai and the Hadza, and like, does does anyone have you know this mental problems? And you're describing it through a translator, and they're just like, no, no, no. Do they have autism? You 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 know you found ways to describe autism yeah. to the no, no, never heard of this. Do they have back pain? No. <laughs> it was so funny. I'll tell this story again. We've kept asking about back pain for elderly. And finally, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, this guy fell out of a tree. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, no, 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 not because he fell out of a tree. Does anyone just have chronic back pain? They're like, no. Yes. But yeah. uh, tell us more. No, go into the mental stuff. That's good. Yeah. Let's, go, let's do the mental stuff. The mental there's, there's like and also the emergency, because you touched upon like if someone had an accident, they do actually have a lot of places I go have ways to treat those. Like since I saw you last, I was shocked when I was traveling throughout Central and South America, the treatments, the successful treatments they had for deadly snake bites, snakes that would kill us quickly. They had amazing, remarkable remedies for it. So while they would have the scar on their leg, they wouldn't die or have to get an amputation like anyone else. So, and that's without a hospital or anything else. In fact, they, they refuse to go to the hospital. So 
Okay, but to to the mental state, yeah, even down to the fact that the women don't get PMS, it's it's on all levels. They don't have attention issues. They don't have insomnia. They don't think about things to make them anxious. When someone dies, they're sad for the appropriate amount of time. So they're not robots, right? They have an appropriate emotional response, but it doesn't stay. It doesn't stay. And so they don't have the uh, impact, the negative impact on their life that we might, right? If we lose someone, we can go into a serious grief, depression. Women who give birth now, it's just common that they'll have um, significant mental health issues after giving birth. This is not seen. Uh, it's, it's literally across the board. And then of course, like you mentioned, no autism. Everyone makes eye contact. Their heels are on the ground. They're social. They're friendly. There's no introverts, which is something I always like to bring up because that was so shocking to me. The lack of introversion. Everything is done socially. You sleep all together. You eat together. You hunt together. You sew together. Everything is very, very social with no one trying to get away and, you know, recover or have a mental health day. There's, there's no such thing as a need for that. And, and you get into the gut health too. Do you yeah. think that's a big factor there? A thousand percent. Yeah. I think the posture and the gut health and also the, the bonding, the social bonding all helps with that. So with our gut, we know that we need a lot of cholesterol in our diet in order to be able to make the feel good chemicals, uh, and the sex, the sex hormones, which, which sex hormones for anyone who's gone through menopause or, uh, taken external hormones, you know how much they affect your mood or just been around a woman who's having PMS, right? So <laughs> we all know how hormones affect our quality of life. They may not kill us or keep us alive, but they, drastically affect our quality of life. And these folks make wonderful sex hormones. And a lot of that is down to their social structures because our hormones are different than the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, and that they respond to stimuli and to relationships. And so it's very important the relationship dynamics you have if you have imbalanced hormones. Well, they, they don't have to worry about that because their dynamics are kind of perfect for the hormonal system. And so it's the, the ability to make the feel-good chemicals within the gut lining to rush up to the brain. Most of them are made there, not all, but most. The uh, In the, the gut. The, yeah, in the gut, yeah. The wonderful amount of daylight that they get, right? Daylight stimulates mm, yeah. our dopamine and serotonin and gets our melatonin going at night. The lack of light at night helps them get into deep sleep, which if any of you have kids, you've seen what happens to people's moods when they don't get a good night's sleep. So that's very important. And then finally, the communal structure. We need a lot of eye contact and physical touch in order to have a healthy mental state. We produce different hormones when someone is making eye contact with us, when we are speaking in person, when we are touching, when we are hugging, when we are sleeping next to someone. And those things are very, very important for our health, not just our immune health, like many people know about, but actually our mental health as well. So I think all of those things play into this just incredible incredible uh, fortitude and almost wellspring of joy that they seem to have. It's great. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. I saw it. And you've seen it more than I have. What about the food component? There's two sides mm -hmm. to food, right? There's just the nutrition side, the, the pro side, and then the negative side of anti-nutrients or you know bad ingredients and stuff that would, could affect the gut. Yes. Like, tell us more because we haven't talked about nutrition much. Just give people the high level view too. I mean, we're talking about they're eating animal foods all day, every day. Yeah, all day, every day. And like when we were with the Hudson together, the young boy who we all think is going to be the chief, I saw him again recently, oh, a yeah. couple of times actually. Yeah, he's, he's nice. definitely on his way. Uh, he was eating Dick Dick Brain, right? And he was passing it around. It's everyone's favorite food. And it's not a lot of food in that brain, but he's sharing it with his hands. So the, the bacterial exchange is happening through the sheriff hands and through there not being plates and silverware and everything being communal. But within the brain there, when you eat brain, you get a lot of uh, serine. So there's the fatty acid serine and there's the amino acid serine. The fatty acid lowers your cortisol. And if taken at night, regulates your sleep cycles and all sorts of good things, definitely lowers anxiety. And the amino acid is desperately needed for nervous system disorders. So although serine and glycine, those two are deeply related. If you all have studied amino acids, you make glycine from serine. Are, 
talked about scientifically as if we make them within the body and therefore they're non-essential to eat. Almost everyone I get across the board in terms of my clients who has nervous system disorders or chronic illness is direly low deficient in serine. And serine is required to rebuild the myelin, to rebuild the nerves. Uh, the importance on it cannot be understated. In fact, there's been some really great studies in the ALS uh, department for reversing ALS and seeing improvement with high dose serine. That said, uh, so lots of organ meat, <laughs> right? Pretty much daily organ meat. Well, yes, daily, actually. Daily organ meat, both raw and cooked. In some places like the Arctic, a lot of raw. Uh, more raw than anywhere else I go. And others, it's a mix, um, never all cooked though. And always animal-based, whether I'm in blue zones, like I was just in Okinawa or when I was in Costa Rica, these places that are known as more plant-based, when you're actually there, the cooking fat is, is animal. So in Costa Rica, the cooking fat was lard. And it actually makes up the bulk of the calories. Now, Okinawa was not really plant-based like they say at all. So it wasn't just the cooking fat, it was all the pork and the fish and everything else. And the beef as well, they're famous for their beef on certain islands. But uh, but yeah, so the, the diet is always animal-based, whether they're hunter-gatherer, agrarian, fishermen, or up in the Arctic. Uh, from all regions that I've been to, it's animal-based. Some have dairy, some don't, some do fish and chicken, some don't, some only do red meat and blooded milk. So the diet varies a great deal, but what it has in common is being animal-based, using a lot of animal fat, using the whole animal. So even parts that in our whole diet uh, in the States, like those of us really trying to eat liver and things like that, I mean, we go to like, when I was in Japan, this wasn't Okinawa and the Japanese and Okinawans are a completely different culture. I want to say that off the bat. Uh, but I was in Japan and I was eating uterus mm. and chicken ovaries with eggs that had oh, been wow. fertilized. Like the level of which the whole body is eaten is on a next level. So you've got things like that. Then food frequency. I've never seen any snacking not even close. And, uh, and it's typically two meals a day is the most common, both, but I have seen one meal a day and also three meals a day. So that varies by culture. Never eating uh, by yourself, never eating out of extreme hunger, um, no fear of not having food tomorrow. So I would say those things really come in, in uh, are really pretty much across the board. Wow. With the diet. Yeah, this is yeah. music to my ears. This is confirming everything that I've been learning in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And you've seen yes. it firsthand. This is yeah. amazing. So so it's not, but they're not eating like pounds and pounds of liver, but they're they're sharing it, right? Like we, we yeah. shared a tic tic and it's a small animal, and then they share little pieces. Yes. I, I think we experienced it together, but remind me. Uh, they would take out, say, the liver, and they might eat that raw or cooked, but a piece goes out to everyone. So no one's sitting down to like two pounds of liver, right? The only exceptions I would say to that is if someone is going to battle, if someone is going to give birth, or if someone is ill, they would do more organ meats than mm. the norm. But because you're eating animal every day, there's organ meat every day. Like when I was in Mongolia, when they served the first meal and it's communal style as well on a big plate that everyone eats off of and you eat with your hands. And uh, like the head was in there, the whole head, you know, <laughs> was yeah. on the plate along with yeah. everything else. And, and, uh, and three animals were mixed in. There was horse and sheep and yak all on the same big, huge, like table size plate, uh, just for a normal dinner uh, with a family. And yeah, so, so everything is very much mixed in. And none of the organs are typically ignored, with the exception of in, in certain cultures, they won't do certain things. Like I, I've seen some cultures that won't do eyeballs and others that prize them. And it tends to have something to do with the mythology of the region, not so yeah. much health. Yeah. That's what I thought. It was just more of like they thought it was bad to, you know, eat someone's eyes because they couldn't see after death or something yes. or I don't know. That's exactly it. Yeah, it goes into mythology more yeah. than anything else. Or potentially, you know, what we saw in Kilimanjaro, there's so many different indigenous cultures there and they all eat different diets. And I think that's why uh, they've maintained peace in that region for a long time is that there's no fighting over the specific foods. So 
what I found interesting with the carnivore in Mongolia is that they also, like the Maasai, don't do chicken or fish. They believe it's very bad for them. And, uh, and so I've seen some threads amongst the carnivore groups and some threads amongst the agrarian uh, threads amongst the others. So there are threads as far as that goes. But I like your take on, on looking at it from the highest level possible. That's what I'm trying to do. And you're saying all these diets are very different, but what did they have in common? And you kind of already said that, but please reiterate. And what did yes. they leave out? Yes. So some other things that they have in common is that they don't trade. So they keep food from within about a mile of their house to max 10. Uh, everything is literally from that region and also no imports. So like sweet potato is not native to Okinawa right? It was brought over in the 1600s. Yet people think of that as the traditional food. Or in Greece, they think of a uh, tomato salad, right? With cucumber. Tomato and cucumber weren't in Greece uh, really until quite recently in many regions 50 years ago and other regions 100 years ago. So uh, these cultures that have the really long lifespan and perfect health, they're not doing foods from other regions and they're eating from right, right there uh, and cooking in the traditional way as well. The things that they don't have would be imports and they don't have really much processing outside of fermentation or stone grinding. So they do have processing in the traditional ancestral uh, way of, of seeing it, but not the modern processing, not the wrappers, none of those kinds of things. Well, yeah, I love this uh, notion of ancestral processing versus modern processing yeah. or traditional versus modern, totally different. Another thing that I have to explain to people online, they, they're like, oh, bro, this is process. Like, like, okay, traditional versus pro modern. Can you go into that a little more? Yes, traditional processing is incredibly important if you're eating certain foods. So for instance, uh, if a culture eats plants, so not all cultures eat plants, right? There's the carnivore cultures around the globe. They don't have to worry about it as much. Actually, they don't have to worry at all. But the cultures that do eat plants or eat a lot of plants, their ancestral processing methods are what keep them healthy. So there are many plants that have plant toxins in them. And if they're not processed in a specific way, you have trouble. So I was in Fiji for a conference and this conference was feeding its people the worst food, not in an ancestral way. I mean, it was, I really tend to not hold too many judgments and I, I was judgy. I was uh -huh. being so judgy because they were teaching these people about nutrition and health and they were serving spinach juice every mm -hmm. single day, twice a day. And, uh, and all these other things that you would just like walk. I mean, I know you well enough to know you would have walked out. I tried to stay, but I did not consume the foods. So so if you take something like that has an oxalate like spinach, it's very important that it's only eaten for the two weeks a year that it's in season and that it's consumed with a lot of dairy that can bind to the oxalate and keep it from bioaccumulating in the body. Um, oxalates, and I know you've got this on other podcasts, so I'll let your audience go and research, but in uh, just as a brief intro, mm -hmm. oxalates are little crystalline structures that are found in different plant matter and they are toxic to all mammals. Most humans, if you have a healthy microbiome, which almost no one does today, uh, can break down about 50 milligrams per day. One cup of spinach has over 700 milligrams and it leads to widespread uh, disease within the body and all sorts of problems. So, so the plant toxins really need to be neutralized or partnered with certain foods. If you take something like the corn, in the Mayan regions that I was in, right? That is a traditional food there. They do the nixtamalization and the five-step process, which if any of you want to learn, Dr. Bill Schindler can teach you through his book and online. Uh, but it has to go through that five-stage process. When corn was taken from the Americas and brought over to the, even to North America, uh, there was a huge pellagra, uh, a widespread issue. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people got very sick. Same thing happens today in Africa amongst those eating corn because it's not going through the stone grinding, nixtamalization, and traditional ancestral processing. So many foods really have to go through that in order to be bioavailable and not harmful to humans. And the pelaga is a vitamin B deficiency. Which one? B6, B something? Oh, no, it's... it's um. Uh, B3, niacin. B3. Mm -hmm. And that's because if you nishtamalize it, it will help open up those B vitamins and it gets rid of these toxins, the plant toxins that kind of 
bind to them so that you can't digest them? Is that how? That's right. A lot of foods have a binding aspect to it. So if you take white rice, it has thiamine binding uh, protein. And so it's going to bind to all the thiamine, which is B1 for the audience. When you get a B1 deficiency, you get beriberi or dysautonomia. You get demyelination of the nerves and you can't really move. You, you don't have the energy to move. You, you can die from it. Um, and it's been in the historical books since about 2000 AD, actually. It's, it's been there, but not as a large percentage of the population. So that would happen in a region that eats white rice or some of the other foods like cassava that can bind to thiamine, but do not eat the thiamine-rich foods. So you will always see something like cassava or white rice in regions that eat pork and fish, and a lot of them. If you just decide you don't like pork, maybe you don't have the taste buds for it, and you eat the rest of the traditional diet, even a thousand years ago, you could set yourself up for beriberi by having the rice without the pork. So, so that's where you the get pork the- Pork is high thiamine. Very yeah. high thiamine. It's one of the few foods that is high thiamine. Thiamine is a hard, hard nutrient to get, and it's utterly important. And a lot of modern yeah. lifestyle depletes thiamine, like coffee, alcohol, stress, all types of stuff. Yes. Carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates absolutely do it. Yes. And we don't really have it in our diet, right? So many people think pork is bad for you and we don't have other foods with it. So without B1, you can't process the rest of the B vitamins. It's not an enzyme, but it's used almost like an enzyme. It's also needed for ATP energy and look at, I mean, everybody wants more energy in America. We're energy addicts, right? And no one really has a ton of it. It's rare to find someone who pops out of bed and has it all day. So yeah, thiamine is utterly important. It also downregulates lactic acid, which for those of you who have studied anxiety and the physical aspect of anxiety, people get in a panic attack when lactic acid is high. So it downregulates lactic acid as well. It, it does a whole host of things that is, um, can be found in very large scientific books, but it is very important. Well, shout out to a big Food Lies supporter, Michael Knoyer, who's actually supporting Dr. Chris Kenobi as well and, and his <sighs> travels and you know doing the Weston Price stuff that he's doing, kind of like what Mary's doing is going around the world and looking at these native cultures. But yeah, he's big on the thiamine. He has a thiamine advocacy group or he has a whole foundation around it. And he's found a lot of people, they have these unknown illnesses or di chronic diseases and high dose thiamine will solve them. So it's, yes. he's doing cool stuff and you might have to do some, a lot of supplementation. You know, usually I, I don't like supplements, but it, you know, if you're like very depleted in thiamine, you probably need some, this like really good high bioavailable thiamine to get back to normal. Yeah, I agree with that, especially the fat soluble. I was never big on supplements, but that one is definitely an exception. Yes. Okay, so we're talking about the, the food preparation techniques traditional cultures used. And so, yeah, I, I knew about the South. Well, Bill Schindler has been on talking about this stuff, but this is really good because people yeah. don't listen to all the podcasts or go back. Now they will, maybe. Hopefully they'll hear this so. one and go back to listen to Mary's, listen to Dr. Bill. But people don't really understand that plants do have defense chemicals, and it's not that plants are all bad. It's just that cultures figured this out and realized they had to do these processing techniques. Yes. Yeah, and if you spend any time in nature, you start to see it. Like in, uh, when I'm in the sub-Saharan, you see it amongst the giraffes in the acacia. The acacia have incredible defense systems against the giraffes that they will implore. And it, you almost feel like you're in a different dimension when you watch it because they can go about it so many different ways from sending a gas into the air to warn the trees upwind for a mile to using the mycelium to communicate to the trees downwind that they need to produce more tannin in their leaves, which they do in an instant, so that the leaves are bitter to the giraffes, but also to engaging with a specific kind of ant to come crawl up the branch and go into the giraffe's eyes. They're a, a carnivorous ant, and so they will actually what? eat. Yeah, yes. And no one knows how they do all of this, but they do it. And they're not, the acacia is not unique, actually. If you think about it, if you're someone who is rooted and you can't move, you're going to need defense systems in order to spread your seed, right? And the seed needs defense systems. So the seed that these plants all release has to be able to keep that little baby alive. And so it has the most toxins in it, but the plants also have their own, just like the acacia. Mm -hmm. So see, so we talk about oxalates, we talk about yeah. nixtamalization, and there's also yeah. like phytic acid. Yeah, phytic acid, 
lectins, there's, I think solanines are the most insidious of all the ones I've studied because they're fat soluble, meaning that they're in tomatoes. Stay. They're in tomatoes, all nightshades. Yeah, they're in the nightshades. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure the soil technique that Dr. Bill talked about where the potatoes are dipped into the, the mm -hmm. soil before each bite may neutralize the solanines, but I'm not 100%. I'd need a, I'd need a food lab to make sure. But mm -hmm. they're the hardest to neutralize. You don't neutralize solanines through cooking like you can with some lectins and not through food pairing either, at least as far as I've seen. And they stay in the body. The toxin stays in the body, you know, 60 to 90 days mm -hmm. and causing harm. So this, the solanines are definitely far worse than the water soluble plant toxins, mm. but none are great. So these, just to reiterate again, these are new foods. Like the tomato yes. was not around forever. It wasn't traditionally a food. So it's always been around, but it was more of a, a decorative plant especially when it was brought over to the Americas. So for about 200 years after it was brought over, it was still just a decorative plant because people knew that it was in the nightshade family and the nightshade family was poisonous. So it's really very recently that it's become a food and only in our very naive modern, you know, 50 years, mm. do we think it's a health food, which it is most certainly well, not. <laughs> yeah. There's this whole notion that, that plant foods are magical, but then there's kind of yeah. the opposite where like there's some carnivores that are like, I'm never touching a plant ever again. And they're all terrible. So we I need to it's tell neither. people, <laughs> neither. Yeah. Tell people how to navigate this road is it's, so it's like, what are the traditional plant foods or what are the safest ones? And like, yeah, what's the nuance here? Humans are very resilient. We're very resilient. We do not need to be kept in, in glass houses, but we also should use our, our brains. Now we need to use our brains as a tool, right? Most of us are living by our brains and identifying with it, not using it as a tool, picking it up and putting it down. So in traditional cultures, they figured out how to neutralize the plant toxins. Uh, carnivore is, is definitely very great in that it eliminates all of those so you don't have to think or, or do any of that. But that doesn't mean you can't eat plants. I eat plants. Uh, there are certain plants that have a lot less toxin or don't have toxin and others where you can easily, um, you know, ferment or process or stone grind it out. And so once you learn that, then you can decide what's worth your time. Like uh, for me, I go based on preference, like what I actually enjoy eating. And then is it easy to process out or can I get it? Like if I, when I was in Mexico with the Mayans, I absolutely ate their uh, corn tortillas. They were made with lard and they were stone ground and nixtamalized and all the goodness. Um, I didn't eat a lot of them, but I did eat them. And uh, but when I'm in Greece, I do not eat a Greek salad. I do not eat the tomato and cucumber salad nor would I, I'm not interested, right? So I go based on what I enjoy eating plus uh, what's been done properly. And outside of that, I, I really avoid the fear because the fear itself is incredibly harmful for your body, incredibly harmful. Yeah, I, I don't like that the creating food fears or orthorexia around it. It's like if someone made me a Greek salad and they're very proud of it and I was at their house, like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna eat it. But yeah. it's just, I'm not gonna eat it every day. You know, exactly. It's, it's... Yes. Yeah. And you would pick different foods than me. But I think when we're healthy, like you and I are, we have a broader range that we can choose from. So when I'm working with clients, you know, the more sick they are, the more rigid the diet and uh, really decisive the diet is. It's not that it, nothing should be rigid, but it should be strict, right? There's a real difference there. So uh, so if someone is disabled and dying or dying quickly, we're probably going to go with like the Mongolian, you know, or the Maasai type diet. And then the healthier they are, and certainly Which once they're in remission, the pure, yeah, animal -based. pure animal based ketosis, all the things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that would depend on the person because you have people with other issues these days, like they have a high toxin load. And so they may need something to bind to the fat soluble toxins to pull it out. So uh, it's not a hard fast, like this is the only way there are a lot of ways to summit the mountain, but that's a, a good start. <laughs> like that's the good way to start. And then, and especially not if they have a, a high oxalate load in their body. Like if they had been vegan for a long time, eaten a lot of raw nuts and done the vegetable juicing and salads, uh, carnivore would not be wise to start with at first until you see what kind of load they have. 
But the healthier the person gets, the more plants I allow. And there are certain plants that I allow in abundance as long as they're eaten seasonally uh, or recommend. Let's say I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a disciplinarian. <laughs> recommend. And, and others that really should be processed appropriately if you're going to consume them. So like if, if we're taking something like wheat, eat it in France where you can have a properly three-day fermented croissant and, and bread. Or if it's, um, if it's corn, have it with the Mayans, right? Not corn on the cob, those kind of things. That's great. But is there any kind of advice? I know it's hard to go through every food, but generally yeah. what are the traditional foods we've been eating the longest with the lowest toxins? Oh, okay. Well, I would say carrots. Carrots are pretty low. Mm -hmm. uh, onions and garlic and mushrooms especially the Asian mushrooms. Uh, not to say that they don't have any, there's some things in there, mm -hmm. but lower. Uh, lettuce, like butter leaf lettuce, not romaine, not the others, but let butter leaf. Herbs, fresh herbs, they do have toxins. They have uh, thiols and they also have um, some oxalates and things, but usually in the portions consumed. So like Small ginger, bit, yeah. yeah, it's perfectly fine. And don't they don't need processing, which is really nice. I'd have to like and kind of fruit. think about it. There's well, like two there's like low sugar fruits and then yeah. there's like sugary fruits. I mean people have different yeah. opinions on the sugary aspect, but yeah, I mean avocado is a fruit. But avocado, mango, any fruit you take is seasonal and they do need to be eaten seasonally. So a lot of times when I'm in regions that we would think of as just having fruit everywhere, like take the Amazon, no. <laughs> There's not. It's just not there. <laughs> and uh, and even when I took you through Tanzania, you know, we didn't even see the berries that the group that was there the week before saw. Oh, yeah. So things are very, very seasonal and short lived. Or take Greece, which has a very long growing season. You know, the figs are there for three weeks and they're delicious, but you're not eating those year round. So the fruit is really there. Uh, traditionally in the same way that it is for other animals. It's to help us get fatty liver disease temporarily so that we gain weight and we have extra fat to make it through the winter. Um, it's not meant to be consumed as a fruit salad every single day of the year. Now, some people might do great on that and that's great. Do what feels good for you. Uh, but for most people, they're going to get uh, chronic fatty liver disease after a while of eating too much fructose. So, um, like I said, follow your follow your own intuition as far as that goes. I think fruit is like so many plants in that it's not essential for human life. It is delicious and it is pleasurable and it can be really good for us. But it really depends on where we are and what our health is, is like in that time. Yeah, well, it's a good dessert and it's good for athletes. It's like people, athletes think that you have to be eating like goose and like cereals and pastas and all this. Yes. I mean, if... I mean, I'm not so big an athlete. I play beach volleyball and I lift some weights for like 20 minutes a couple of times. But yeah. then, yeah, I can have some fruit. Like that's the the carbs that I want. That's like a clean version. Yes. But I'm not yeah. just sitting there all day eating it because obviously I get it. Like there is a balance to all this. <laughs> There is. And I, I mean, when we're healthy, which you're very healthy, Brian, uh, you have a lot more leeway to do what you like. Like my friend Yuri that I was visiting out in Tokyo, he eats so much fruit. Yuri, forgive me for mentioning you. Uh, he eats so much fruit, but he's very healthy. He doesn't have any downside to it. So if you're not trying to come, you know, outgrow an illness, uh, if you're not deeply motivated by that, fruit is one of the best sources, right? Um, because it's at least natural and whole and all those good things and doesn't have the, the plant toxins. But that said, fructose does get broken down by the liver and our liver is very, very busy with fat soluble toxins these days, both from our microbiome, but also from externals like the polyester clothing that we're, we we're wearing that soaks in as estrogen into our body and has to get processed through those so same channels as fructose does. And so there's just a lot of chemical onslaught that we have today that can make fructose more difficult to break down, but not for everyone. Some people, those channels just run very smoothly. So it's a case by case on that one. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. There's environmental toxins. There's the polluted air. Like nothing yes. is as clean as it used to be. And yeah, yeah I got a Merino wool shirt on. I'm all about Great it. Job. Yeah. <laughs> Great uh, job. 
All right. So there is balance. I hate the word balance though, because then you end up with the food pyramid or these, you know, mainstream ideas of balance. Like, no, no, we're talking about completely different type of balance. So we understand that. We understand some of these plant toxins. We talked about traditional processing. So modern processing, I guess that's obvious to people, but that's just everything in a boxed package. That's, you know, refining weed. That's all of the modern stuff that is, should be avoided. Yes. Yeah. And with balance, you know, so often people are afraid of getting eating disorders or giving eating disorders, but I was the head of a mental health clinic for years and years and saw countless cases of anorexia, bulimia. They were almost all from deficiencies in very specific things like B6, if you're deficient, will trigger bulimia. Zinc, if you're deficient, will trigger anorexia. And so there's a lot of physical causes to these. And what we see as extreme, like take the Mongolian diet, where all summer they eat nothing but dairy. Nothing. This is actually the Kazakh diet. Um, uh, And then in the winter, they're eating horse and all this meat. Uh, No vegetables, no plants, ever. Uh, That would be very extreme to us, right? And people would be like, oh, you're going to get an eating disorder from that. But it's not. Uh, It's not extreme. It's actually more classic and more ancestral and more traditional. So Yeah, I agree with you. I think balance, the word balance can be uh, a bit dangerous. And also I think the in moderation has been used to sell us a lot of things that are not really food for us, not nourishment. But at the same time, I I see so many people in this area of fear and uh, paranoia, which I think is even more unhealthy. So I think, you know, control what you can which is what you put in your mouth, what you dress your body with and how you think. And don't worry about the things you can't control and always feel good about what you're doing, whether Mm. it's what we would call an extreme diet, which is not, or a very uh, quote unquote balanced diet, which also Mm -hmm. is not. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, I like it. So back to the the anorexia and these deficiencies, believe me, that's so interesting Mm because I feel like some of these people who... They, it's this vicious cycle, actually, that they get, they, they're told the wrong information. They're, they're trying to diet and they're avoiding all animal products, for example. And then they could be really low in zinc and these other vitamins. And then that triggers the more severe mental disorder or eating disorder. Is that yes. kind of correct? Uh, yes, a thousand percent. Yes, because zinc and B6 are really rich in animal products. And and they're utterly important. If you don't have enough zinc, you, you can look at all the animal studies, which there is a plethora of, where they pull zinc out of the animal's diets and they all stop eating. Mm. All of them. Yeah. Wow. Same thing with B6. If you pull that out, uh, animals and humans binge. Binge and then restrict, binge, restrict, binge, restrict. It's not life circumstance. It's not your mom telling you to diet. It's not the scale or, or the reaction to the scale. It's very, very deeply nutritional. That's amazing. And no one knows yeah. about this. It's, yeah. But they, we created this through our backwards <laughs> nutrition ideas. Yes. Completely. And it seems like women, they, they're kind of preyed on more with all these crazy diets. And it's like, you got to avoid meat. You got to avoid fat. You need to avoid cholesterol. And then they get these disorders. Yeah, our bodies are really designed, the female body is really designed to put on weight, right? That gets us through hard times and helps us give life to others. But it's designed to put on a small amount of weight, right? To have those rounded hips, not to be chubby or obese. And what a lot of the, uh, because of that, when the American and when the worldwide diet started to shift, women saw it first, right? So women would gain weight when men wouldn't. And because of that, women were more inclined to immediately start and try to fix something. Of course, that's also that a lot of our value comes in being beautiful, right? And attractive. Classically, and and I would say still today, although not across the board, one of the things that makes a woman very valuable in a man's eyes is her beauty. And that includes being svelte, except for the the few that are into like those feeding fetishes and things like that. (laughs) (laughs) But, But in general, and it is different by culture, some cultures like a more rounded woman, but in general, svelte, we'll call it, not skinny, but svelte. Whereas for men, it was traditionally more being a provider right? And creating safety and a home. So we still have some of that in us. And because of that, women typically want to look good and, and will do a lot to get there. And I think that's very obvious by the amount spent on the beauty industry, right? Surgeries are through the roof right now. 
So what's the solution? Eat an ancestral diet? <laughs> I think the solution to everything we've talked about today is uh, public education on the wisdom that these traditional cultures have. And I highly recommend to anyone, if they have the time or the gumption to do so, to look into what the ancestral traditions really are and have been. Because if you go in line with ancestral traditions, it's a lot less likely to get into these kind of trouble situations that the, the plant-based diet can bring you, like the zinc and the B6 deficiency or the juicing with the oxalate issues. It, you don't have juicing in traditional cultures, uh, not vegetable juicing, and you, and you don't have a entirely plant diet in traditional cultures. And so these things can be immediately taken off the table rather than discovering through years and years of accumulation and then new chronic illness uh, that it wasn't the right way to go for your body. So I, I think that's, if we can do kind of public-wide education, gain respect for these cultures, potentially, potentially they would uh, turn that respect onto themselves, keep this wisdom alive in their cultures and uh, continue to be uh, the small little window into what is possible mm. for human health for the rest of us <laughs> in society. I appreciate that. But I also talk to a lot of people. My job is talking to people basically yes. about this stuff for years and years and years. Yes, And it's hard for them to understand. And it's hard for me. I'm not going to change anyone's mind in a 10 minute conversation when they say, well, I like to drink the green juices and how yeah. could that be bad? And plants are magical. And I do feel good when I do it, or I lost 10 pounds and this is what I did. So there, I, I don't know what's going to happen to them, but there could be this long-term lesson, like you mentioned, that they could learn the hard way, yeah. but also maybe it's fine for them. Maybe they're not going to overdo it, but how do you broach this topic with these people that they, I have to do this almost every week, right? Where yeah. I'm talking to people and they're just all about it. And what am I going to say to them? I can't even imagine. I, I don't even try. Socially, I keep it off the table I, as much as I possibly can, with the exception of if someone is coming for my advice. That's very different. But I would have no friends if I was talking about food at dinner parties. So I try to shut those down as much as possible because I enjoy my friendships and, and my social relationships. But um, I think it has to be, well, one, what you're doing is utterly important. This whole podcasting and YouTube sphere is I so wish it was around when I was sick. People are learning about things so much faster. But in terms of getting to the, the broad public, like to, to where the laws could change for the indigenous cultures, which right now are horrific, like they can't wear their clothing and be seen by anyone. And also there, there's some very restrictive laws that are in place. So to really get at that aspect, I think it has to come from the top down, actually. And it, from studying international conflict management when I was younger, when I've seen that work has been when there's a lot of pressure from the international community. I've really only begun thinking about this in, in more recent months as to like what could be done because I've been a bit uh, taken aback by the extreme modernization that I've seen and the, uh, the sadness that I feel with what I've seen and, and knowing what's coming, but not that I have a crystal ball, I'm not psychic, but I've seen enough patterns to know most likely where their health is going with these moderni modernization, uh, implement what they've implemented. Right. And so, and so, yeah, I, I don't want to give a problem without a solution, but I, I'm also, uh, humble enough to know at this stage that, uh, my solution could make things worse, right? Uh, we see that over and over again when someone comes into a culture they don't fully understand and starts trying to fix it. Almost any nonprofit in another country would be a perfect example. So, so I don't know, but I would say in general, I think it has to come top down. I think the individual governments need to give respect to these people uh, in order for them to maintain it themselves. And perhaps that could be a heavy handed thing given from the international communities so that those individual governments do it. But again, that's just a loose brainstorm. It's nothing mm. I'm very solid on. Well, no, it's, well, we, we're not going to solve all the world's problems yeah. on this podcast, but I mean, yeah. well, on that worldwide issue, another yeah. example that I've heard about and read about is 
so say like there's a shoe donation and they give hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes to this whole community and it seems great and they don't realize that now this shoemaker all their whole economy has been disrupted because yes. now you know so you don't know these unintended consequences that's what it seems like yeah. what's going on they're like oh we're going to give them sacks of grain and they're going to live and they're going to have food and it's going to be amazing and yeah. the next thing you know they're all having nutrient deficiencies and dying and relying on yes. these terrible foods and it changes the dynamic socially as well. So yeah, I've seen the shoe thing over and over again, but also let's take t-shirts. So everyone always brings a ton of clothes from the States when they go to any of these regions. And I'd really implore you all not to, because when clothes are brought in, they're often polyester blends and polyester. You're giving them to people that have always had either no clothing or the things like silk, like I'm wearing, or wool, like you're wearing, or fur, things that are naturally antimicrobial and therefore do not need to be washed. And wick moisture, very important. Polyester, um, all of the modern materials, they do not regulate heat, they don't wick moisture, and they need to be cleaned. And so when uh, indigenous communities put these on, they of course will sweat or get hot or get cold. It doesn't regulate their temperature, huge problem. And two, it keeps the moisture in. So they start to get skin funguses and infections that are actually very significant. Finally, the shirts break down. They don't know how to care for these items, right? They also don't have the equipment to do so. And so they start to get holes. Well, to them, having holes in these clothing, it's nothing. They don't even think of it, right? They still feel regal and all these things. But when foreigners come in and see these, these communities and clothes that are falling apart, they think, oh, these poor people, what can I bring you? Let me bring you things. And so it turns into a savior and victim complex, which is a huge problem because you bring in the religion, you bring in the clothing, you bring in the food, and suddenly the culture is falling apart. And it would be like if, um, I gave this example recently, it would be like if aliens came down and were like, oh, hey, humans, you guys are doing everything wrong. Let us fix it for you. And we started looking at them as the authority figure. Well, that turns us into a culture that doesn't no longer gets authority from ourselves. And that is where that regality and the health of the people gets destroyed. So small things that may make us feel good or that are very well intentioned to really genuinely do something good for someone can can really destroy a whole culture. Well, and the alien example, it's like, and what yeah. if they started telling us how to eat and what to use and like, oh, well, you yeah. just need this like xenon, you know, gas for your, your bodies will be, do better. And, you know, all the, it just won't work. Exactly. Yeah, whatever exactly yeah, whatever <laughs> wacky you know, diet and lifestyle they have is not going to work for us. No, and it's a problem. So like when the grains are brought in to a culture that's not used to them, let's take some, uh, some of the communities around the equator. So they're dealing with a lot of infections. Like when I was in Ethiopia just a couple months ago in the Omo Valley, they had a horrific outbreak of Bilhazia, which is a, a parasite that's in the water that causes paralyzation and death. It, it is a bad one. You don't even know you have it for six months to two years. So you're just walking around mm. just fine. And then suddenly you're not. Hundreds of thousands of people have fallen to that. Then there's a cholera epidemic. There's, there's several epidemics going on right now. Now, if you or I goes there, we are going to be a lot more prone to getting that. And if we took an average American, even more so, right? But the, the cultures that are still living in their tradition and eating in their tradition, they don't get these things. It's only once they start eating our food that then their immune system is weakened. And now, even though this thing has been in their environment, it's now a huge problem. So, so yeah, it's, I, I had this wonderful English teacher, a writing teacher really, in high school, and he was always getting us to write about where we were. For me, I was always interested in exploring the world, so I was like, ugh, it's a bummer. Okay, I'll, I'll write about Ohio. And he was saying that, that uh, you know the most about where you are, and so that is always what you should write about. And I think we have the same problem with our tendency for giving. But if I flew to where you are in Austin and I just suddenly started diagnosing problems and trying to treat them, cultural problems, social, social dynamics, it would be so wildly inappropriate because I wouldn't have a full understanding of what was causing those issues, right? And I'm American, but I'm not from that region. 
It's the same thing with trying to help people in different regions. You don't know what's going to be help and what's not, and you often don't know until it's too late. So, um, yeah, I think with so many of these things, there's such a, it's, it's almost interesting. When I was in Fiji, some people started some new projects to help the villages there, and they had never been there before. And they, they're sweet. I love these people, and they have wonderful hearts, and they really are very good people. But I also, and I, I have a weird life experience of having spent so much time with these groups. So, you know, I don't know what to say and what not to say, but uh, there's so much in America that needs help. <laughs> Maybe, like, keep it local. Uh, it's the same thing. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So small things like whole foods can cause a lot of problems, both in ourselves and in these regions and, and, uh, things really are very, very regional health and culture and all of those things. Yeah. Uh, this all makes sense. Uh, I want to, so we talk about the worldwide, I want to go back to what I was talking about with the world starting to change someone's mind or the, yeah. Not, I don't want to change their mind either. You you just avoid giving nutrition advice at the dinner yeah. party, which is smart. But I'm not a nutritionist and I do people do ask me for advice and I will mm -hmm. give it maybe or I try to do very broad things or really work with them and where they're at. But how would you talk to people about how what they're doing, like they think that they're doing the right thing or they're bought into this view. Do you, do you, if you had to try to work with them and they did ask for help, how would you yeah. attack this? Because Go it's hard it. if they just say, Hey, but my doctor said that fruits and vegetables and grains is the base of the diet mm -hmm. and I should avoid red meat. How do you, you know, how do you get through to someone who believes yeah. that? Well, I would start with, for me, if it's like someone coming to my office, I have that all the, ha all the time, right? So that I've dealt with for over a decade. But uh, usually I, I would take it from, do you feel your best right now? If not, then maybe let's look at other things. And I would always address the doctor issue of our doctors are not educated in this field. So they don't have more knowledge than you do, or the public does. And the public is primarily educated by the food companies to sell things, especially in America. But honestly, everywhere, you and I saw all the vegetable oil being sold and promoted throughout the, the couple countries in Africa that we went to. So I usually start from there. And then I start from a historical context. And what I usually get with people that aren't sick or that are just trying things like people on the juice cleanse when I was in Fiji is uh, there are different levels of nutritional knowledge. And so one practitioner or like take the medical medium or someone who's not even trained in anything, right? Um, uh, but promoting this kind of thing, you're gonna see success with any change of the diet if you're coming from as drastic of a place as the American diet. You're gonna see a change in some people with anything that you change in whatever direction you go. It doesn't mean that it's an optimal human diet or ideal for that person. There are levels of knowledge and those of us those of us practitioners, especially who work with the sickest among the sick, uh, the most disabled, we have to go the deepest and we have to know the most. And there are constantly new layers being developed and being discovered, really not developed, but discovered. And I, I imagine that will continue and continue and continue because what we have done is made something very simple that never had to be thought about, very, very complex by messing with nature. And so, <laughs> and so, uh, and so, you know, typically the argument is like, well, this guy teaches this and he gets all of these results. And I would say, yes, and he will with a certain portion of the population. But this next practitioner who teaches this, they deal with more sick people. And so they have this level of knowledge. And this one has this level of knowledge. And this one has this level of knowledge. And so it typically gets peeled back as the person themselves has dealt with things. Uh, so, you know, many people in our community have gotten out of a health issue and, and they tried the things everyone recommends and it didn't work. Uh, and uh, the other is from practitioners that work with the, the sickest of the sick and that those techniques do not work for either. That's a good point. And Mary does that, by the way. Uh, you should go back to listen to our first episodes that we did. And she has an incredible story of healing herself and, and tons of other people. But yeah, like any anyone on Instagram can just start posting pictures of salads and, you know, 
help people get from the American diet to salads. That doesn't mean they know anything about actually deep nutrition or, or healing really sick people. Yes. Yeah. And I would also say, depending on the generation that we're dealing with and the microbial damage, the microbiome damage in shift, uh, some people are much easier to get better than others. So like my parents' generation is a breeze in my office when they come in, right? Uh, they didn't have all the microbiome damage that our generation did. And the children of our generation have incredible microbiome damage, right? They're dealing with things like um, pandas from strep infection. We used to just get sick with it. And so it's, it's significantly different uh, with each generation. And therefore, things that worked in the 80s are not always working in the 2000s. <laughs> what do you think that microbiome damage is from? Oh, definitely from all the things we are doing, from our diets, uh, from the antibiotics, number one, and the C-section births. Those would be the two biggest, along with not nursing or nursing as long. But also the shift in our sleep schedules. The lights really shift our microbiome to a great degree deal and also not being outside and the lack of touch and community that that does as well um but of course our diet our diet a lot so the combination of our modern diet plus antibiotics is a huge one yeah that that's exactly what i thought through all the interviews i've done it's it's all those same stories and not yes. having a normal birth you have the c-section you don't get all that microbiome from your mom uh that oh yeah not, the not breastfeeding the in, the formula is a nightmare Yes. Yeah. And the child also needs that bonding and that feeling of safety. I don't know if you noticed, but the kids just don't really cry in the traditional villages or even in like, like stage two villages. They're not really crying. <laughs> There's not temper tantrums and things like that. They're very, very calm and bonded and they let anyone pick them up. Um, they feel very safe. We don't have a lot of kids that feel safe these days. Yes. I noticed that too. Uh, the the worse the diet, I mean, I don't know that many families, like yeah. not all my friends have kids, but you, you can tell like the different diet, it's pretty yes. obvious which ones are getting the good diet and which ones aren't. Yes. And, and also to the microbiome. Yeah. When we first showed up with the Hadza, they had that tic tic and we were eating the liver and they just had this dirty knife that's never been washed and so they dirty. cut it open on a rock and it was yes. covered in dirt. And it, then the piece of liver they gave me was covered in guts too. It was yellow and white and green and it had all this weird stuff on it from the guts. And I just ate it and I felt amazing. Yes. I think my <laughs> microbiome improved so much since going to Africa. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yeah, I think I'm really lucky. I get I get touched with that stuff all the time. And it's very common for the film crews I take to get sick. You guys were an exception. Uh, it's very common for a lot of stomach, whether it's vomiting or diarrhea. So far, knock on wood, I have not had it once. And I feel really lucky. I've been able to eat all these foods and kind of contribute to my good, good bacteria with these trips. Yes. Oh, I've yes. never felt better on these trips. I never have stomach yes. issues. It, it's great. Yes. That's why I think these Harvard researchers, I've probably told this story like six times on a podcast about these, these Harvard researchers that study the Hadza and they think they're, it's magical because they eat like 100 grams of fiber per day. I'm like, they don't eat 100 grams of fiber no. per day. Where are you getting this from? No, They're and all, all of my trips to the Hadza, and I've been so many times and amongst different clans and different villages, but I keep returning to the same ones as well. I haven't seen almost any fiber, like <laughs> almost it's not, any. But yes. the story, the story goes is that we ate the tubers with them when we we're the second Hadza group we were with yes. and they baked the big old tuber and then they gnawed mm -hmm. on it and they spit out all the fiber. It was indigestible. Yeah. This was not, and I yeah. think that these scientists come in, Harvard has an agenda. People know that by now. Yeah. It's a nightmare. It's a propaganda outlet and, but from the food industry and farm and whatever agendas. And they, they're they like, oh, let's weigh this giant tuber and we'll calculate how, 100 grams of fiber. Like they didn't eat any fiber. They spit it I out. Know. They got a little bit of glucose out of that and they spit yeah. the rest out. And not all the clans eat the cassava, right? So some of them do. I love Cassava, I eat cassava. I will have it in my kitchen when I'm in the appropriate regions. But um, there are a lot of problems with cassava. There's cyanide 
and other things. Uh, and there's good things to it as well. But the fiber is not consumed. And I would say about three fourths, I could look through my notes, but about three fourths of the Hudson clans that I visit don't consume it. It's very regional. So you move a few miles and this new clan is not going to be eating it. Mm -hmm. They don't grow it in that region uh, or it doesn't grow wild. But so most of them are not consuming it, but those that do are not consuming the fibrous bits. In the same with one of the groups, I peeled a lot of the pumpkin leaves, which of course pumpkin came from the Americas. So it's only recently been wild there, mm -hmm. but the whole work was about getting rid of the stems and all of the fibrous oh, bits that we would absolutely we saw be that. eating. Yes, exactly. They spent so long stripping out hard. the stuff. I was bad at it. I got judged by the ladies, yeah. rightly so. I had no idea what I was doing. It was difficult. Yeah, But, but that's yes. just a modern thing. That's a modern yeah. thing. That's a whole other story, which we won't get into, is, is how they're pushed off their land. They can't hunt big animals. Yeah. Well, there haven't been big animals for a yeah. long time. There used to be way more giant megafauna roaming the earth. And now they have even less animals to hunt because they're pushed off their land. So, of course, they're trying to find cassavas and different tubers and whatever leaves. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't even say like trying to find, it wasn't like they were hungry, you know, they just, uh, that food was there. And while the men went to hunt, the women would prepare the plants. But again, some of the clans I visited didn't do that at all. So I try to go back to the same clans and through different seasons and through different years, because you do get humbled a bit and you see different patterns, things like that. But I definitely have some clans that to this day, I haven't seen them consume plants amongst the Hudsa. So um, that could be luck of the draw when I'm there each year or each season. But it's not like a, I, I so often, I, I want us to see from the regular Americans and, and listeners standpoint, which I know your audience is much better educated. But in general, um, in this area, the education is really lacking. People tend to think of the indigenous or hunter gatherers as constantly hungry and like, uh, you mm. know, their life is threatened for not getting food and they're never hungry. So, uh, so when they're preparing the pumpkin, the pumpkin leaves or the cassava, it's just kind of out of like, I've got some free time. I'm going to do this. I'll put this on the fire. It's not out of hunger or dire need sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, another discussion too. Is that yes, that we yeah. had these short, miserable lives back in the day, and that's not true. Yes, debunk that. All the children times. died. Yes. Yeah, the children dying. Yes, it did happen. It brought down the average. All this stuff. Even too, we don't even know how old these people were. If you dig up some bones, yeah. you can't just tell how old the the person was or our ancestors were. We can yeah. use proxies. We're like, oh, well, this looks like they were sixty or fifty yeah. because the modern humans have worn out bones by the time yes. they're 50, right? Yeah. But this dude could have been 100. Well, that's and what they're finding. So, and that's not surprising given what you and I have seen. But uh, but I think for, for the average bear, it certainly is surprising. And that is that uh, you don't get the same degradation of health at the same age. And that's the same whether we're talking about animals that are fed a zoo diet versus animals in the wild. Same with humans. Humans on their traditional ancestral diet and lifestyles, our bones are fine. They're great. So a uh, bone of a hundred year old in you know a region of the world that hasn't been modernized could look like the bones of a 40 year old uh, in America or in Europe. So very, very different. But, uh, but really I think so often a theory or a myth that's been put together by someone who is not in this field, it gets taken and just assume like, well, yes, of course that is true. And I would say most of the things that we have about our health are also the case. Like this idea that we died young is so silly. Uh, the, the time where we saw that the most was during the industrial era. Uh, when people were moving into cities and starting to eat refined foods and foods that weren't grown right there or produced right there. So um, we have this idea because it was our great grandparents' generation and great greats that that was always the case for humans, but really it was very city based. And we, we see that far back, right? Alexandria uh, had health issues. In Egypt, they had uh, diabetes and they also had uh, oxalate issues, but the percentage was so tiny. It was less than 1% of the population that would have these issues as opposed to us. So um, they did have it in large cities and in specific large cities, but not to not to our degree. Not to our degree. Now <laughs> everyone has it. Oh, man, there's so many things to unpack here. Well, we, we got to cut this off at some point. But before we go, because we're speaking about age, we got to talk about the yeah. blue zones. People may oh, have yes. seen the latest Netflix thing. 
what is it? Dan Buettner goes around living to a hundred, yes. you know, story of the blue zones, whatever. I tried to watch it. It's just so annoying. I can't, I can't finish these things because they're just so annoying. So Okinawa yes. was the first place that he went and you went there recently. So can you just tell us a little more? Also you went to yes. Ikaria and yeah. uh, we went to Costa Rica together actually. Yes. And oh, that's a- right. We did. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've been to all of the blue zones now, and uh, and I was just in Okinawa over this last month, and I knew quite a few Okinawans before going, and had interviewed them about their diets and things like that and their parents' diets. So uh, already, you know, I had the idea that it was probably pretty silly that they lived on sweet potatoes and a plant based diet when they're on an island. I've traveled to too many indigenous islands, uh, and not in one have they not eaten all the sea life all the time. So, and typically pork, usually wild boar is on islands, and, and that's the same in Ikari, or sorry, in Ikari as well as, as uh, Okinawa. But Okinawa, people talk about it as if it's Japan. And I think it's really important for people to understand that although Japan now rules Okinawa, Okinawa had their own kingdom until very recently, their own language, their own culture, their own way of doing everything. And they're really seen as Okinawans above being Japanese. Um, There's a long sordid history there that you all can look into if you're into history and a bit of a history buff, you'll find it fascinating. I know I do, but it's very, very different. And, uh, And upon landing, so they're there are hundreds of islands in Okinawa. I think that's where we should start. There's 49 that are inhabited by humans. And uh, and it's often talked about as if it's one place, like one town or one mm-hmm. village. Uh, you know, same problem with India. People are like the, the diet in India and each oh village God. is different, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so very big. similar here. Yeah. Yes, in fact, when you speak to an Okinawan, if they're from a specific island like Ishigaki or Mayako, whatever island it is, they'll have a specific food that they recommend. Like, oh, you must have the Ishigaki beef. It's famous. It's generationally famous. It's wonderful. They'll have a recommendation and it is always animal based every single time. Mm. But I think a problem is that with many of these blue zones is that there's people going in that are not have not formally studied nutrition or medicine or any of these things in order to have an eye for what the people are actually eating and what's on the plate and also an eye for health conditions as well. Um, they're also not historians. So they, they miss a lot of the picture, but very few people speak Japanese, right? That are going to Okinawa. And I don't know any foreigner that speaks the local language. So there's a lot that can be missed there, just like with Greece. But to be honest, you don't even need the translation issues for this one because the food is so apparent. Pork is everywhere. Fish is everywhere. The amount of animal products there was mind-blowing. It wasn't like Costa Rica where it's like, okay, well, I'm not surprised. You know, there's pigs on each farm and they're eating the meat and using the fat for things and uh, for cooking. No, this was like so blatant that you had to almost look for where are the, where are the vegetables, Mm. where are the plants, (laughs) like, cause rice isn't a traditional food there. So in the, in the big cities where you have the U S military base and things like that, you have things as modern as McDonald's there. And it looks like a Vegas, no lie. Like I was so confused when I first landed. I expected it to be modern, but not that modern. There's <laughs> there was, uh, neon lights and there was just like all the things that you would see on the Vegas Strip, right? Now, in addition, there was traditional things there. So if you had an eye for it, you'd know what to see, like the the Haru hard alcohol, which they call sake, but it's really more like a, a vodka or something much more stiff. And that has the very poisonous snake that's inside it. So they have four deadly snakes on the island, more in the water. We swam with them. It was not as scary as I expected, actually. I thought I'd be really afraid of those snakes in the water. But the, the deadly snakes are all over the islands. Uh, they're in the cities, they're everywhere. And they catch them and then they kill them and they put them in the hard alcohol. And this is a famous drink that you drink there. Um, but yeah, lots and lots of the pork and the seafood and all those things. And it is a different diet than the Japanese diet. So I want to really emphasize that. So 
after the first island, obviously I needed to get out of there and get to some of the more remote islands. So I went to some of the most remote that you can get to. And there's still modernity on those islands too, but nothing like the first, nothing. And and really lacking in the things that you need as a foreigner. Like you can't get around, you can't get taxis, you can't, there's no Uber, there's none of those kind of things. But people are very nice. I hitchhiked a lot. <laughs> and, and the people that picked me up also ended up kind of touring me around and taking me to private beaches and all sorts of wonderful things. So very, very friendly, very safe, very calm culture, and uh, very lovely. And the food on each island was slightly different, but it did always have a very heavy animal base. I mean, we're talking like three fourths of the diet as animal based. The sweet potato, the purple sweet potato is so often promoted everywhere. But really, um, that's just part of the diet. It wasn't in most places I went to. And the bitter melon that's been talked about as well, it was in the grocery stores. The grocery stores are like markets. Um, so less like what we have in the States, more like a market. And, uh, and uh, like a small, it would be like one bitter gourd for the whole market. <laughs> so it, it wasn't, it wasn't a large portion. And then right beside it would be so much horse meat. So, mm. so much horse meat, <laughs> so much beef, so much pork, so much seafood. Um, and, uh, and just really wildly different than it's been promoted. So I took a lot of videos and things, but, you know, I, I think the blue zones are, are just really quite silly, to be perfectly honest. After having been to all of them now, I, I see better health in all the indigenous places that I go to or anywhere that still does very traditional diets and lifestyles. And, um, and so not the blue zones. You're, yeah. You're like anywhere you go where they're still really living traditionally. That's yeah, anywhere where the you go. It's are. not just five yeah. places. It's all over the world on all the continents. Um, they're quickly disappearing, but I think that could be reversed very quickly. The, yeah, most Greek villages that you go to are going to have the same thing. Whereas as soon as you get kids going to college and eating modern diets and then coming back, yeah, that all goes to pot. But you see that in, in European cultures, not in, in all throughout Asia as well. So in places that have very, very big cities like Okinawa, you can have these perfect kind of like... Uh, it's like people have an aura around them that protects them. You know, you wouldn't know how to explain it unless you you uh, had studied a long time or had seen a lot of these patterns. But uh, it makes a lot of sense. We we can be healthy on so many different diets, but there are things that we need. There are things that we absolutely need to have, and all of these places have that. So, uh, yeah, Okinawa was was no different. I would say it was more modernized than some of the blue zones. Um, not not all regions, of course. And I certainly didn't go to all 49 islands. I would love to. Anyone can fund me at any time. Uh, but <laughs> totally joking. I don't even have a way to do that. But the uh, but the uh, but it was it was just so wildly clear that they're not plant based. Well, yeah. Also, I, I read about that they did some of these studies that they mentioned in the blue zones book or stupid TV show that it's like, yeah. Oh, it was like 90% sweet potatoes diet. And this is what I read is that this is, yeah. they took this right after world war two when they were destitute, they had no way of getting uh, the animal foods that they were used to. And they were forced to just survive on these potatoes. That's exactly what it was. So they had to give their food to the soldiers. So they were eating primarily sweet potatoes and what, argument I've seen online is uh, from the plant-based crew is that, well, now they're getting health issues because they're eating the meats and things like that. But mm -hmm. no, any historian or just open up any uh, anthropological book on this region, they were eating what they're eating now. They were eating the meats and the fish and the horse and all these things uh, and not primarily sweet potato beforehand. And they were greatly healthy, <laughs> greatly. And in fact, there's a, there's a man, I just caught his Ted talk because I've been trying to understand more of how they could have gotten Okinawa so wrong. Um, and it's most people that wrote underneath the video could not understand him because he has a heavy accent. Um, but if you're patient, uh, you can you can definitely hear what he's trying to say, and he's he's saying that he's he keeps going to these blue zone conferences and trying to tell them that this is not how people eat in Okinawa, <laughs> and no one is listening to him. And so he oh, did a wow. TED talk about it, and he's a doctor. So um, 
That's I'll awesome. see if I can find that for you. But yeah, it was it was really great. So people from that region will be the first ones to tell you that the way that it is being promoted is not the way that people eat on that island and has never been. It was a very short blip of time during world at post-World War II, and it didn't last for very long. And it's certainly not responsible for their health um, because their health was, was as good before that period. Yeah. Well, it's yes. also just simple nutrition. It's like there's nothing like nutrient wise that sweet potatoes have that are magical. It's it's pretty yeah. empty in nutrients that the body and the brain need. It's just starch. Yes. And it doesn't make any sense. It's like yes, yes the animal foods, the the pork. This well, they they regard pork as a longevity food forever. They do. I, I remember reading that and some stuff. So, oh man, uh, I hate all the this modern propaganda that. Yeah. It's just confusing so many people and we, yes. you talked about Icaria on one of our old shows but you saw the same thing they're eating sheep lamb and they're eating nose to tail they're eating all the organs yes uh, also oh yeah costa rica we talked about because mm -hmm. we visited there they were they had yeah. the dairy cows so they're making the homemade cheese they're drinking the milk the raw milk they had yes. their chickens running around the pigs running around they'd sla slaughter pig each month or each whatever and save the yeah. fat and cook everything in the fat See, that's another thing where well, you, you kind of alluded to the, the invisible things. Like if you're not a nutrition researcher, you won't see. You don't yes. see really what they're cooking it in. If you just see food, you don't yes. know that they use a whole bunch of pig fat, pasture raised pig fat to cook some of those vegetables in. Yes. Yes. And milk fed pig fat. So they were feeding the pigs the milk, which is a, a thing that I'm seeing more and more in some of the really excellent heritage farms but uh, milk fed pigs are so nutritious for us that's so. actually what we did for our nose to tail we had the the corn free soy free pigs and we had this small group of ranchers and they yeah. would get the leftover dairy and they'd get mm -hmm. like from the they, they didn't need and they'd feed them they'd kind of ferment it and they yes. would uh it's yeah. ideal it's ideal and it doesn't have the lectins and all those kind of things that can be problematic. So it's really great. But yeah, the the fats are often missed. And the fat is such a high caloric intake in comparison to, say, a carbohydrate that unless you're used to breaking this stuff down for research, you just don't see at mm -hmm. all. Yeah, you yeah. don't do the volume because you could look at my plate. I eat 85%. I did it once. I never calculate anything, but I did it once retrospectively and I was 85% animal foods by calories. But yeah. some of my plates, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I had some sauerkraut. I have some pickles. I have some stuff yes. like that. And it, it could have taken up a portion of the plate, but those have no calories in it almost. Exactly. Same with the starches, like the cassava, almost no. So yeah, that tends to be the picture I see. Animal-based whole foods. That's what it's all about. Mary's done it all. She's been around the world. She works with people. You're you're not working with people so much individually, but you still have your team. How do people yes. reach out to you or kind of work yeah. with you if they have problems? So right now I'm just getting back from a three-month uh, uh, tribal study around the globe. So I've been away from Wi-Fi, but I'll be back on shortly. So enableyourhealing.com. You can always reach me. I would say Mary Queen of Heart or my Instagram, just look up Mary Ruddick. I'm not active on there like you are, Brian, and so many other <laughs> people because I'm often either out of Wi-Fi or when I'm in, I'm back at work and catching up on, on everything like emails and whatnot. But I do hope to cut up all this footage and make it available to you all soon. The um, I'll probably start maryreddick.com, like launch that soon because Enable Your Healing is really becoming more of my nervous system disorder uh, program. But I'll keep you informed and that'll be on my Instagram when that happens. I have a little small fledgling YouTube as well. So when I can get mm. things up, you can find that. But again, everything can be found under my name. Just Mary search. Reddick. Yeah, search Mary yeah. Reddick. You'll Easy. find her. <laughs> yes. Amazing. It's been so <laughs> good catching up and uh, I'll see you soon. All right. Sounds good. It's so good to see you again. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.